you to review afterwards, copy, paste, share with other people, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, I'll show my screen now. <clears throat> so, what is it that we would like to learn today or talk about? Um, in order to be responsive to your needs, we've got a bunch of topics, but um, we're going to try to list things on the board so that you leave having your questions addressed. Um, even if we don't know the answer, we'll do what we can to, to them. Somebody like to tell us who you are, where you're from on campus, and any things you'd like to have addressed, um, whether it's a question or a resource you'd like to share. Those are all good. All right, Andrew. I'm Andrew. I'm from Ag and Applied Economics. This is my first academic year on campus. In the fall, I'm teaching a course for the new time that's going to be in one of the active teaching labs. Um, <coughs> one of the, the, the active learning classrooms. You've yeah, got all kinds of technology to work whistle. with. Right, right. And it'll whistle. be a technology heavy class. So it's going to be a natural fit for project based stuff. Mm -hmm. And I have not used large projects or group projects in my teaching previously. So I'm here to sponge up stuff. Well, and some of the tech uh, enhancements, we'll call them. How do we do that? Just a question, how many of you have been in either as a class or taught in any of those active learning <coughs> classrooms? Sterling Hall or Whistle or there's one in nursing, there's one in Van Nuys. So like That's one group kind of the pods. They're sort of around campus, yeah. yeah. Okay, so some of you, good. They're scary, um, especially if you've never taught in them before because so often we're used to like lecturing too, and now all of a sudden I've got to walk around, how do I do this stuff, I've got to do new, the pressure to do new activities. Nursing, when they built their building, their whole building, um, Nancy Nicholas's, Nancy Nicholas is a, uh, an active learning building, and they freaked out. The, Collectively, they were like, we need to figure out how to do this um, because it's different from the way that nursing has been taught. Good. Uh, Brian or Mario, if you want to go next, we'll just go around circle. I'll jump in. Um, my name is Brian Lacoon, and I'm the coordinator of academic engagement in the center for the first year experience just across the hall. So I coordinate um, Counseling Psychology 125, which is the course that helps students um, if they have to take it with the transition to life at UW-Madison. Um, it's called the Wisconsin Experience Seminar, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. so all of our topics <coughs> we try to tie back to the Wisconsin Experience in some way, shape, or form. And we usually have them do like a big final project at the very end of class that relates to especially like purposeful action, but bringing in the other components of the Wisconsin Experience. But I'm just trying to think through like what does that look like? Do we have other ideas or uh, ways that we can Know, put students in small groups or have different ways for them to interact and to do different projects um, rather than maybe group discussion or um, you know discussion boards and things like that. Not that those things aren't great, but I'm just trying to think about different um, different styles of engaging with particularly with these students. Different active learning options. <clears throat> What's the other kind of like structure of those stuff? So we meet once a week for an hour and 15 minutes. It's co-taught between a faculty or staff member and then an undergraduate student. We call them um, undergrad teaching fellows. And so we usually will cover everything from looking at like their strengths, their values, um, why they're interested in their personal you know, major or career. And then we'll jump into things like academic resources, support resources, wellness. Um, we do um, some prep with them for you know, looking at like, okay, this is your goal. Like, who are the folks that you need to be meeting with on campus, or how are you getting involved? And so it's sort of like this kind of catch-all. We try to look at like the academic side of things, but we try to focus too on like their personal and social well-being as well. It's only fall. Uh, typically, yeah, for the most part, we'll have 34 sections in the fall, um, and it's kept at about 20 students. Yeah, <laughs> and then um, we typically offer two sections in the spring just because our <coughs> student enrollment is a lot lower and so those classes are usually smaller. For first year students, 
for it, it's cool because a lot of the students, this is their only small class when they enter Mass of Madison, yeah. and so they can be in these classes where they're just a number and the instructor doesn't know them at all. But now they're have in a class with only 20 other people, <coughs> and um, including an instructor and a, a student who's a year or two ahead of them, who can kind of help nurture the. Well, how do I navigate this campus, you know, like literally and um, emotionally and <laughs> mentally? Right. All of these things. Good. All right. So other ideas for that. Cliff. Hi, Cliff Cunningham. I work with the Learn UW team, and uh, I do I, I try to provide the support for a lot of the learning technologies we have on campus. Um, so I come to every one of these sessions. My office is just upstairs, and I come to every one of these at night with teaching labs because I kind of never know what you guys are doing in the classroom. Um, but this actually top the top of your Wisconsin experience has been on our radar. Has been on my radar quite a bit, and for some some reason it's really been hitting in the last 18 months. That has really I've just been noticing. It and what places, and I'm going to kind of advocate for this. It's a good idea. If everybody on campus were to somehow reflect on this. There's a lot. Those four basic principles are just they're just good words to live by. And if it's reinforced and if it helps in some way to create more of a sense of Wisconsin community, I just like it. All right. Like that. Jessica. I'm Jessica Drury, and I teach in biological systems engineering. So mostly, I was just looking for some inspiration, especially. Uh, the context of how to do some project-based learning in a summer accelerated format. Ooh. It kind of feels like that might be more challenging. Yeah. <laughs> how big is the, the class? Oh, uh, so we're not sure, so I'm developing it. Okay. So and you'll have them, I assume, more more time in a given day. So it's gonna be online. <laughs> I know. So <laughs> I know, but I'm like so torn because I feel like there's so much value in like doing projects. Oh, and they could be you know individual, but it's still like you just don't have the yeah the length of time to really delve into something. So it's just I don't know if anyone's tried this summer accelerated I just like to online. <laughs> sure. <that's, laughs> Let's start the shallow end of the pool, shall we? That's how I do this thing. I don't know. And do you know about the Blend at UW? Pro, uh, have you been attended the Blend at UW program? No. Okay. Have we been to online at UW? So I was going to apply for that for the summer since I've never taught an online yes. course. Just, just, just me as a reference for that if, they, <laughs> if there's a spot for references because, yeah, that's, this is a perfect. Yeah. Challenge for that <laughs> yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Well, and they're also doing their first summer version of it, which will be more online. So there will be a lot of things you can learn from yeah. from that experience. Good, Amy. I'm Amy Jeffer Becker. I'm from the medical school. I'm the uh, director of curriculum and instruction for the MP program. Um, so we do a lot of different project based or pro mainly, I would say, problem based. So we do a wide variety of different things throughout our program. Um, but primarily I'm interested, probably going back to like the tech enhancements, we are pretty low tech, um, but thinking about how we can ramp that up for students and have students just kind of ask for different technology um, tools, I'll say, and so we're trying to think about how we can do that better. More tools, more options, very good. All right, Tom. I'm Tom Brown. I work in College of Agriculture, stationed in University Housing, beautiful hall, the one with the greenhouse on top. You've never seen that. Uh, but I have two, two jobs on campus. I work in Leopold Hall and we kind of have a weird little secret society of the utopia for project based learning because, at least in spring, we have five seminars ranging from beekeeping, woodworking, gardening, uh, microbes in the kitchen, and basically all of them are small. Is microbes in the kitchen kombucha brewing? That is one week is uh, beverage week. Okay. Yeah. And composting properly? Uh, I don't think that's on the syllabus. Okay. Yeah. Microbes in the kitchen sounds like a bad rock band. And on drums, Cole Cunningham. <laughs> uh, and so that's the structure of our learning. My 
other job I've got is, is with that Alan Centennial Garden, and this would go under you know, resources rather than questions. My job is to help people uh, use the garden for their classes. Um, so if you're developing new courses, or if you're fresh on campus, and you're like, I want to use something that's cool um, uh, and project-based and outside and is a garden-based, and we've had not just the plant science courses work there too, art, dance, counseling, psychology. We, we do a bunch of like yoga classes there, like recreational sports, love the space. So um, I can provide some support and some kind of education on developing new things, even <coughs> just for a one week kind of thing. Um, Questions? Questions. How can I be of help to people All right. if they are interested in using the uh, Alan Centennial Garden? Very good. For projects. <laughs> Martin. Yeah, so I'm Roy I'm an instructor in the biochemistry department. And uh, there's one course, I teach several courses, or co teach several courses. So there's a course that I teach, or co teach, which is for non science majors. <laughs> so these are students who were not majoring in a science course, or at least a biological science course, but they're required to take a biological science credit. So I was just interested in maybe implementing some something for project-based learning in that class because, you know, they're not, you assume they're not too interested in science, right? Because they didn't major in science. So just to think of uh, maybe some ideas or projects that they could do that are interested to see what people are doing and if they're seeing some difference there or something that they can try. So, <coughs> throw up one more question while we were yeah. writing. It's just like, where does project start mm -hmm. in our definition? Like, what makes an assignment or a big assignment different from a project in this context? That may end up being rhetorical, but it's something I'm thinking about. All right, what is PPL? What is project-based learning? <laughs> Let's start there. And then we'll also talk about what is the Wisconsin, how many of you have heard of the Wisconsin experience? How many of you keep your hand up if you think you're familiar with it enough to be like, I can name the four pillars of it, uh, right? Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, so that's good. How many of you have actually started to implement it in your coursework intentionally? Looking at you. <laughs> Anybody. Yeah. So we've got these handouts in front of you, the, the Wisconsin experience. And um, you've probably all heard of the Wisconsin idea. The boundaries of the campus are the boundaries of the state. The idea that what we do in these hallowed ivory walls should not stay in the walls, but should help the good people of Wisconsin and um, essentially the rest of the world. Um, and we do that through research, we do that through outreach. Um, but do we do that in our math classes? Do we do that in our um, small seminars on accelerated summer courses? Ex right. How do, how do we do that? Do we do it just via online teaching where we try to reach out to people across the state, across the world? How, how can we connect? Um, how can we expand that? The Wisconsin experience came out actually um, probably eight years, ten years ago now, where they said there's something special about what we do on Madison. And they cited things like we have like the top number of Peace Corps volunteers. Why is that? What is it that we do that that makes this happen? And they said, well, it's the Wisconsin experience. Um, and at the time, it was much more of a residential campus. Focus. Um, how can we get people to come to campus so that they can have a Wisconsin experience? And of course, people would say, "Oh, fifth quarter of Camp Randall is part of the Wisconsin experience." <laughs> and it wasn't ever really defined what the Wisconsin experience was. For several years, people just said, "Oh, it's something unique and special," but sort of amorphous. Um, about three, four years ago now, the four pillars of the Wisconsin experience were put together by the Dean of Students, the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning, um, and they had folks all over campus talking about these things. Um, in K-12, there's a lot of values. 
um, that schools say are, you know, we want to produce students who don't just know these things, but are good citizens, are kind and respectful to each other. In many ways, um, the Wisconsin experience is sort of a value-based, unofficial curriculum. We want our students, um, and if you ask, they'll say, and our citizens of campus, staff, faculty, um, custodians, everybody, um, to have empathy and humility, to be relentlessly curious, to have intellectual confidence so that they can say, well, actually, I think this, um, and be willing to stand up and say that, and to engage in purposeful action. And that's, that's kind of cool, right? It's, it's kind of, as far as teaching and learning, as far as educational research goes, um, having purpose, having that intrinsic motivation, I'm going to do this thing. If you get students who come in and they're like, I'm totally sold on this, I want to do this thing to make the world a better place because my kid brother suffers from whatever, whatever, they are the easiest students to teach. And they are the best students to have in your classroom because you don't have to teach them, you just have to get out of their way and let them learn. Um, having students <laughs> who have some humility and empathy so that they're not jerks in the classroom and shut down your class conversations, that's important. We, it's important not just in the classroom, it's important in the workplace, right? Nobody wants the jerks who don't care about other people in, in the world. Um, curiosity. Do the people in the classroom need to do something only because it was assigned and they're going to get points out of it? Or are they actually genuinely interested in this? Same thing in the workplace. Are they going to just sit around waiting to be told what to do? Or are they going to step up and say, oh, what if we did this? What if we did this? And then intellectual confidence. Do they have the confidence to do that? So they're good things. They're not things that we often talk about in, in school, in, in, in our educational, traditional education, because our traditional education is based on sort of the cognitive aspects. Um, can you understand it? Can you remember things? Can you explain things? Can you synthesize, evaluate, um, create new things? Those aren't really value-laden. It's not like, can you create things kindly? Can you, <laughs> can you, you know, <clears throat> have a good purpose behind creating things? I, I want to see that room grow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's hard to value, to judge, to do these value things, and I think that's part of it. You can say, can you remember these five facts? Here's a test. <laughs> answer these questions, it's a multiple choice question, you know, it's easy to grade, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you come in and you say to your students, I'm going to test on whether you value something, uh, we start getting into the sort of gray, well, not even gray, like uncomfortable territory where we're starting to say, are you brainwashing the students? Are you... Um, indoctrinating them into your value system. Whose value system are you indoctrinating them into, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in some ways, it was an experience uh, pamphlet and the four pillars. It does a pretty good <coughs> job of, of addressing sort of safe, universal, you might say. Um, these are things that most humans say, yeah, oh, these are fair enough. They, they align with my value system whatever the specifics of my value system are. Still, it's not a thing that we try to rubricize or assess on, but we want to do it. So how do we, how do we foster these things in a system that doesn't assess them, in a system that is based on the cognitive aspects <coughs> of, of learning? Anybody got that answer? <laughs> that's the challenge that we have. So that's what's kind of experience. Project-based learning. This is totally Wikipedia, right? Um, active exploration of real-world challenges and problems. So you can say, my assignment to go do a research on a topic that interests you is a problem-based or project-based um, Challenges and problems. How is it different from problem-based learning? I'm fuzzy on that, actually. 
it's bigger, I guess. It's multiple problems rather than just one. Although pretty much any complex authentic problem is not just a single problem. It's interconnected with other things. Active learning, inquiry-based learning. Inquiry-based learning might sound like relentless curiosity. It is. Um, Student-centered. Um, <clears throat> well, anytime you're in a real world, real world, you're going to run into different people. And so in many ways, you're going to need empathy and humility in order to deal with them. You're going to need intellectual confidence. These two things are just so nicely tied together, project-based learning and just sense experience that um, just makes them more pleasant. It's not teacher-led. It's not rote memorization. Um, generally not paper-based, although obviously there's paper involved because paper is good technology um, for the years. Posing questions, problems, or scenarios. Is case-based learning project-based learning? It's certainly problem-based learning. If the answer is um, theoretical versus real world, that might make sort of a difference. Um, does it just solve a problem that's already been solved? Probably in problem-based learning. Is it a new problem or a problem that hasn't been solved yet? That it would be maybe more project-based learning. Other thoughts on that, JT? So who identifies, I guess, realistically, Nate, into this sort of goes to your question, who's identifying the project? Is it student-generated, this is my project for that course, or is it sort of the instructor saying, here are five or ten problems in this field, and then it's generated from that? I guess in your, in your example of the Wisconsin experience course, what are students doing? They're identifying themselves, or is there sort of a, a team to the course? <coughs> yeah, so we have them for their final project. They are tasked with thinking about like everything that we've talked about leading up to that point of the semester, mm -hmm. and then they have to come up with, I think it's individual-based, though. I don't think. This is the first time I'm teaching it currently this semester, so I'm sort of like learning as I go. Um, but it's individual-based in that we have them think about, like, okay, if you're interested in occupational therapy, like what is the thing that you want to address as you either like work through your degree and or like after you graduate. And so is there a particular problem or something that you want to do, like you were saying, like to better the community or, you know, what does that look like? Or are you creating access for those places that like are part of rural communities? And so we sort of give them a little bit of a framework, but really kind of let them run with whatever their interpretation might be of that. Um, and it can be large scale, it can be small scale, and then we talk about like what are the things that you learned throughout the semester that are, that are going to help you achieve or be able to work toward like achieving that goal, whatever that may be. Does that help? When I taught the course in the last year that I taught, it was the first year that they had sort of this uh, poster presentation. Mm -hmm. We had one student um, look at the, um, the dark sky uh, pollution, light pollution. So he was going into engineering, and his big thing was, I want to look up and see dark skies. And here I am in Madison, and I look up, and it's all fuzzy you know, light. Um, so let's look at full, full box lights that shine down instead of shine up. Mm -hmm. and they don't have the light leaks. That was cool. It was about him. It was project-based. He had to figure out how to do this. Um, they had to write a business proposal for it to like sell it to other people. There was another person who um, looked at her bathrooms and she said, why don't we have these Dyson, Dyson air dry things? Why are we still using paper towels? So she looked into what's the science behind air versus an economic between, between that and these things. And it was about her dormitory or her residence hall. Sorry, residence hall. Um, so, <laughs> you know, very personal, very local. But, I don't know, sort of interesting. All right. So student-centered, I think, is uh, gives the students some agency. <laughs> so if it's a problem or project that's, uh, that I, as an instructor, assign, you get this project, you get that project, you get that project, the students might not have the buy-in. So what agency do, they, do you give them? Um, and it could just be some, you know, if the sky's the limit and it's a blank palette, 
it's scary for the students because it's like, where do I even start? What do I do? What does it look like? Um, so giving them models or even giving them choices of like, here are five things. I know in engineering there's a person who does project-based learning. She's got 120 students and she breaks them up into groups. She cannot have them all do individual projects. It's just logistically impractical um, to do that. So she says, here are a dozen community organizations that we're working with. Um, find one that works with what you're interested in, and I will help facilitate that. She's been doing it for years, same organizations. She's got it sort of figured out at this point, and every year she might add another organization because it's a manageable thing. So starting off small, expanding as that goes along, but still being able to offer the students choice and agency. So it's not them being assigned, it's not teacher-led instruction. It's not a smooth path, um, but it's, it's student-centered. You've got another question? Yeah, I was just thinking, I don't know, what in, I guess other people's experience, is this a semester-long adventure, or is it more of a senior year capstone, sort of two-semester, if not longer, adventure? Because it just seems, I don't know it's my perspective, but it seems to be more fulfilling if it were a longer-term project. Because then you are drawing on all of the, everything that you've learned mm -hmm. over however many years and semesters in the group program, but a semester long sort of project is kind of, you know, <coughs> begun quickly, ended, and then you move on to something else. So I don't know if there's much meaning. So the senior, well, that, go ahead. I was saying that I find that interesting because I'm trying to envision myself as a college student, and most of my time in college, I didn't care about anything. So it's like prolonged would not have made it any more meaningful to me. And I just think, I don't, I'm just curious just how many of you are dealing with kind of beginning first first year students. They don't have a lot of life experience to draw from. They're not, you know, yeah, later on in the career, later on in the academic path, maybe you could uh, expect the students to kind of engender this big picture thing. But otherwise, it's like, when I think of projects, it's usually just like for a semester. And I'm just like, here's my course, and I got to go do some kind of project on you know something about color in, in the atmosphere, and I got to go for it to get whatever. It's like, so I, I just I just feel for people. I'm not all saying that's what it should be. I just feel for the, for the instructors. Like you're trying to create a project a project experience for students who may not be terribly motivated. It just seems intuitive to me that step. And a beginning student I ran agricultural economics or the medical school, it would make more sense to start with a problem. Because then by the time they get to their end of the degree, they're able to identify a project or a hole in the field that hopefully, you know, their experiences could solve. So maybe a sliding scale of project-based learning seems more applicable across the four years. You know, it's, it's a curriculum adjustment that we can make with all the I think it's, a, it's an excellent point. We start off, they're not able to do a full project the first time you try. Sorry. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, you start off with the problems. What are the small things that I can do? And what are the small things that I'm interested in? If I had been asked to, as a first year student at this point, to like identify something and focus on it for the next four years, you know, by the second year I'd have hated it because I changed my mind. I didn't even declare a major until my senior year. Um, so that would be really hard. But can we start to, you know, this is Kratwell's um, affective domain, Kratwell and Bloom. You've heard of Bloom's taxonomy, and that's about the cognitive. Do they remember? Do they understand? Do they, um, uh, um, synthesize, evaluate all of these things, create, you know, higher levels of, of, of thinking, um, they say. So the affective element of it is about value. And when you start off as a first year student, maybe you're just sitting in the seat listening, but you, you're not, you don't care. And then when you're a sophomore, maybe you've declared a major, so you start to care a little bit, and you start to, I mean, responding is just, I'm responding, you ask me some questions, I'm answering the questions on the test for a grade. When you start to value as a student, now you're like, okay, 
I'm invested in this. I'm starting to do this. Organize my world by that and characterize. This is identity construction. And you start off not having really an understanding, but you can't just jump in and say, I value these things without sort of going through that process. So to your point, yeah, start off with these things and eventually work your way up through some trial and error, mistakes, low stakes, mistakes, failures. These are great learning opportunities. So I think just to respond to your question, I think part of your question, as I heard it, was about kind of length of time and what's appropriate, how do you engage students in that? And so at the Met School, then we have lots of different examples, but one that comes to mind um, most recently that we struggled with is students do quality improvement projects okay. um, where they work with a clinic and, and they get to identify the project and think about how they can improve the system of the clinic. And they were doing that over three semesters. So initially when they came in and then kind of their first semesters working with a small group of students. And we actually got a lot of feedback that that was just too long of a time because it's sort of like, it's just kind of like dribbles and drabs. Like it, it's just, you know, they work on it and then they kind of leave it for a couple months and then they have to kind of come back to it and kind of re-engaging with the community clinics was just sort of hard over that length of time. Um, so we're actually just <coughs> you know, really shortening that up and condensing it into one semester and we'll see. But with that, we've also brought in faculty that are going to mentor the project. So really, like you're talking about providing some of the scaffolding of are they choosing the right, you know, project? Are they asking the right question? Um, are they thinking about the right implementation rules? So, you know, I'm not sure. I think it's really dependent on the project is kind of our sense because we have other projects that are more longitudinal and I think it just depends on you know, what the students are doing, what questions they're asking, and if they're engaging with the community or other, you know, who else is involved in this. I guess uh, you're, you're correct. I think my question more was kind of about the logistics of it. What would that look like in a one semester, I guess, the sequence? Because to me, I envision this, the project to me doesn't necessarily occur in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So what is happening during class time? Is it? In this so, example, yeah. what's happening during? Um, What's happening during class time? Actually, not a lot. I mean, we so for this example, when they we do like an intro to quality <coughs> improvement, so we kind of give them the fundamentals and kind of like a case that we walk them through and it's like, well, like this is how you do QI work essentially. Um, and then we really send them out. They have to meet with their clinic partners because there's QI people at the clinic that they work with. And then uh, it's a lot of time of like work with your group, and we have some classroom where it's like group work. So you're working with your group, and then mentors come in and help you help guide your project. Um, but a lot of it is outside of class time, and I think that's why like the longitudinalness of it didn't work as well because it's like students just don't keep that going on a consistent basis if they're kind of left on their own to do it. And it's hard to track as a as an instructor, or even a department, to do that. The dissertation or a thesis is a really good example of project-based learning, right? Because yeah. it starts off oftentimes as I have a, a an idea or a paper, I'm going to take that paper, sometimes out of self-preservation, and turn it into a thesis, or, you know, now I'm going to do another chapter and then another chapter based on the same thing, and it just sort of grows off of itself. Lots of complex things. Um, and then you're in the midst of it right now. Um, but at the undergraduate level, we have the undergraduate research symposium. Have any of you been to that? It's amazing. It's kind of amazing to see all these students with their posters explaining what it is that they've been doing, oftentimes not just over the course of a semester, but over two or three semesters that they've been working with people, um, sometimes outside of the class. In-class work is fantastic for projects for undergraduates um, because it's much easier, especially if it's a team-based thing. You're giving them the time to work on things. You're able to watch and see that they are working on these things. Scaffolding, the idea of starting with something small and based on that success with a small, low stakes thing, they're able to do this next harder thing, able to do this next harder thing, and then you know, at the end of the semester they look back and they say, oh, I've got all of these things already built. Now I just have to go this far instead of nothing, 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 project do this huge um, end. If you do these steps and you see them in class as an instructor, it's a lot easier to um, 
step in, redirect if needed, answer questions. Uh, they feel more support and uh, more more lower stakes things rather than one high stakes things. Sort of a, a big um, emotional support, I guess, for that. And then they look back and they say, look at this cool thing that I did. Public facing projects, if you can do it, are great because it's a thing that they can now say, dear grandma, check out this link of your favorite grandchild um, learning so much. Aren't you proud? Please send me money. Um, <laughs> or their friends. Look, I went to school and I'm learning these things. Or their parents or sisters, brothers. Um, and the, you know, their younger siblings will look up and say, huh, you're doing this cool stuff. We don't do cool stuff like that. That's kind of a nice thing. JT, you have another question? Um, just for the undergraduate symposium and for undergraduates generally, is anyone aware if there's a pot of funding for students to fund projects that they otherwise would have? I, I believe that there is. And I'm I assuming think that they're not working with other faculty. They're individually designing their own sort of ideas and using mm -hmm. financial considerations. For most students that I work with, There are several university pots of money. One is LNS, CALS has one, they just ended in the audit yesterday. Um, usually, the student does need to identify a faculty advisor just to have some sort of, because there's money involved. Um, but it's, my impression is it's generally student directed. And, um, but yes, $3,000 is the number that I've seen thrown around. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's a, 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 a good question. <clears throat> All right, let's get to some of these things. Um, how to manage? How to manage projects? How do we start off? And this is to JT's question. And maybe to Andrew's question. Like, all right, I, I want to do this. I, I'm sold on it. But where do I start? How do I facilitate the beginnings of these so that we can eventually build up? Thoughts on this? I think it depends what you want it to be. Is it like you were already talking about it? Is it going to be a semester long project or is it just one class period? You know, are you going to have groups that do something each class period? So you have to notify you know, what the length, but then also it depends on the, the level of the student. So for me, if I have nice major students, I have to make very simple projects. But if it's more of a Specify the people that are in the major and they're at a higher level, like a senior, then it can be a more in depth project. Yeah. So it's going to be just dependent on. Start small, start simple, and meet them where they're at. Remember, it's a student led thing. Um, so, <coughs> how does the content that we're covering, and usually, you know, covering the content is sort of a passive thing. We take the content and we throw them off, we hope that it sticks. If you assign them to connect that with their lives, um, and it's not always easy, right? Sometimes it's very easy. Oh, we're studying genetics, and my mother had breast cancer, so there's a there's a connection. I can I can make that connection. But I'm in a math class, learning some form of math that I will never ever use again. And how do I? I have to be here in order to get into engineering. But how do I make that connection? Well, make me make that connection. I need to figure out how to make that connection. And I don't know how to do it right now. But if I see <clears throat> Cliff make the connection and Jessica make the connection, and I, I'll pick up some of those things. Like, oh, I, I can relate to that, or I can relate to that. I guess my particular angle would be this other one. Um, I think having students discuss and share with each other how they make connections, the people that don't make the connections immediately will start to pick up that, one, it's normal to make connections because other people are doing it. It's possible. Um, and two, well, they have a, good, a lot of good ideas. I've never thought about it that way. So starting with making a connection to their lives 
starts to get them invested in the, then they can have it as a more student centered, I guess. Um, every time project based learning comes up, I mention the UW Madison intro bio. Um, and the idea this was for a, an honors class, intro bio, uh, bio 152, 151, something like that. Bio core, I don't remember what it was. Um, but 2010 it was. And the idea was using media. So we've all seen. Um, STEM tutorials, bio tutorials, where it's like, here's the whatever cell, and click here when you're ready to do whatever. And they're kind of boring. Um, so they reimagined it and they said, <coughs> it has to be accurate. Um, it can be metaphor, story, whatever. Um, and you have to get involved. To start it, they said, come up with an idea, make a pitch. Your group makes a pitch. So they pitched to the class. The class gave them feedback on it. They refined the pitch. They pitched to the faculty involved. They put together a storyboard. So they figured out what it was going to look like. They had to work together to do this. They um, created a rough cut with video. And then they created a final cut with the video, which is now posted on YouTube. But they had a big celebration. They rented out, not enough free, the um, play theater in. Memorial Union, got popcorn, invited the friends and family, had a movie night where they showed off these videos. And I want to show a few parts of the unit. Know, this one I like because it's just um, stop action. But if you hear the background music, this is the music for Inception, the movie. One of the people <laughs> in the group was not a biology major. They were in this course, they were interested in, they were a music major, and they wanted, they contacted the um, composer for this and got permission. So they went through this whole other non bio route to create and, and to get the music for this. They did all of this part. They learned a lot about biology because they were working with this group of people that were doing the RNA replication of the envelope. But it's really intense because the music makes it intense. There's another one. And these had to all be fact checked, right? By the um, by the instructors so that they, they, they were sort of true. It's another stop action one. Um, this one probably would never be done again after school shootings, but um, here it is a story in the res halls. And draped in its yellow protein capsid, it seeks out potential host cells to infect, take over, and propagate its own kind. It is very selective and wishes to find a complementary cell X to bind matching glycoproteins via a lock and key mechanism. Is that going to be the perfect match? Doesn't seem to be the case. Oh, but wait. How about that cell? Oh, yes. Looks like it found a viable host. And with the mischievous spurt, it passes to the cell membrane with its cell X. Once inside, receptor proteins called endosomes, as illustrated by the receptionist, then willingly escorts virus X into the cell. That director of cell lines, sensing the presence of the virus, sends out chemical messages called interferons, which warn surrounding cells. You get the point. They had fun doing this. They had to take this process <coughs> and write a script around it. They had to get it checked so that it was fairly factual, metaphorically accurate, um, enough to pass muster. And then they had to act it out and create the process of it, decide what do I put in the project presentation, what do I leave out. And all of these sort of decisions they had to, in some ways, work with each other and with the inhumility, um, recognize what they knew and what they didn't know, say what they knew, intellectual confidence, um, and create this sort of fun project. So this was a full semester project. It wasn't a multi-semester project, um, although they 
replicated it uh, one or two other times after that. It was a lot of work for the instructor, but this was also 2010-11, so it was iMovie time. It was not yet the era of mobile devices so much. Um, we had, there was another one that did um, Lego pieces, stop motion. Like they, the students had a lot of fun with these sorts of things. It, it can be fun, or it can be a pain in the butt. Um, how many of you love group work? As undergraduates, do you love group work? Why not? I hate people. <laughs> <laughs> one, yeah, I've got to work with other people, and especially the ones that aren't, that don't carry their weight, right? Or, or worse, the ones that are control freaks and need to take over everything. What are some of your reasons for not like it? There's always somebody who doesn't do anything. Somebody who doesn't do anything. Other people? Time management. Time management, yeah. For me, we didn't have cell phones, and we had the phone in the res hall and that was it so trying to figure out how to get together at the library and somebody doesn't show up because they're unreliable or so yeah it was logistically a big pain in the butt technology can help right having the work happen in the classroom can help with that giving them spaces in, in canvas are you all familiar with groups in canvas you can set up groups the students in that group have all of the many of the rights and um, abilities of the um, instructor. So they can start discussions. They can upload files much easier than they can in, in student discussions um, because they've got sort of a level higher of um, space. They can edit pages. They can create modules. Um, it's kind of a nice way for them to organize things and use Canvas as a project management tool. Um, as an instructor, you can go in and say, all right, every group, I want you to turn in this assignment with your pitch. They create the pitch together in their groups, discuss with each other what needs to be done in discussions if they want to. Um, it builds humility and empathy for the students and for you because you know how hard Canvas discussions are. You give them a chance to be in charge of it. They start recognizing, huh, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. My expectations of my instructor now are a little bit softened because they're doing the best that they can because it's hard. In some ways, this is a, I used to do um, game design and have students do games. And when we first started talking about, tell us your game ideas and we'll build the game, they'd come, they'd come in and say, oh, we want to do this, build Doom, but with Madison. And then, you know, you just give us this million dollar game. And we're like, oh, okay, you can't quite do that. Our budget's $3,000. So it's, it's hard to do that. Once I started saying, you build the game, here are some craft items. This, they, they built fun games, but they were fun for like two minutes, and then they weren't fun anymore. Um, but then when we built them a game, they're like, oh, this is really a lot better than the game that we built. And so they're their understanding, their empathy of the process was a lot better. But still, as a project, what do I put in the game? What do I leave out of the game? How do I simplify? How do I balance um, you know, chance or introduce chance so it's not just a, one, it can't be all chance, it has to be some chance, some skill. A lot of these critical decisions, both on the cognitive level, need to be made, but also on the affective level, I want it to be a fun game, so how do I make it fun so that we get the buy-in? And there's a lot with projects that, especially if they're shared out, uh, the peer performance is a huge factor of it, right? Um, I want to build something that the rest of my class thinks is cool. So how do we do that? <clears throat> so we talked about scaffolding. We talked a little bit about Canvas, um, groups and such, uh, different active learning options. If you're going to be in an active learning classroom, those are great for group projects because they're meeting around a table so they can have this sort of face-to-face -face discussion. I think the whistle spaces, do they have name tags? No, they've got the little whiteboards that you can write your name on, I think, right? I haven't been there in a while. But so the students will start to learn each other's names. Um, I think the 
that's a big part of creating empathy and uh, a, a cohort of trust. At least I trust that you're not going to carry your weight and that I can know this, and that helps me deal with it a little bit better. Um, well, for the tech enhancements, what were people wanting to know or do? I don't remember. For me, I think you you mentioned the time time management for groups. That's a big part of it. How can technology help us um, organize or make the process smoother, both as an instructor but also for the students? Um, and I think a lot of that is just communication. Um, some sense of holding each other accountable um, is sometimes easier if you've got them on you know Grouply or WeChat or whatever. Versus, how do I get a hold of you? I'm not going to see you until I get to class. So the, the tech can really help with that. Google Docs, being able to all be in and collaborate at the same time, to be able to go in and see the version history. So who changed what when? Um, being able to assign actions, you know, plus Jessica, whatever that was saying to you. Um, these things can start to to really help that. I really like the Google Docs embedded in, in like groups within Canvas because then they have a shared workspace. But I'm also a passive observer or an active observer depending yeah. on the situation. Uh, and it's within Canvas, so it feels a little more classroom y. And yeah. I, I don't have to get invites from 12 different groups to go in, it's all in one space. Um, so Something as simple as, as, as this, for example, you can have the embedded thing in there. It's within Canvas, so it's it's still in the classroom, so it's kind of a sanctioned space. You're able to see it as an instructor. They feel like it's not just a thing that they're doing, but they're coming into the classroom space. So it, yeah. they would have a little bit more. And, and they can't lose it. And they can't lose it, right? And you can't lose it. <laughs> oh, I lost that Google Doc link. Yeah. <laughs> Could that be essentially like an assignment? Because we have a lot of, as you're talking about like scaffolding, we have a lot of assignments that help build the project. Yep. So could that be, and then you can assign that to groups so they could essentially complete an assignment. Yes. Through that. Okay. Yes. Um, did and, and, and the assignment could be make an embedded Google Sheet or Google Doc. In your module, in your group space on Canvas. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that the um, making them into assignments, again, gets back to that idea of scaffolding so that you can kind of follow along, intervene if they're going off in a fancy garden path where they don't go anywhere, or if they go someplace bad, um, being able to have that accountability, or at least the perception that, they're, that they need to be accountable. So even if you have this, but you don't get to it every week, they don't know that you're not getting to it every week. So it helps them. Do you have any tools or ideas or anybody about, because we have a lot of examples where we have project-based learning with community partners. Yep. And Canvas doesn't Not very work well for that. So does anybody, I mean, obviously, like, Google Docs, which is saying, but just the communication and kind of working together, do you have any cool ideas? I think Canvas, now you can't have guest. Um, Cliff, you're going to have to double check on that, but there's a new <laughs> role in Canvas that you can invite non edu people. Like, uh, well, you've always, well, you've always been able to invite non UW people. There's a process for it. It's kind of cumbersome. You know, as far as oh, I role. thought there was a, a role in there that was less cumbersome, but maybe not. Um, uh, uh, there is. I'm, I'm not recalling it. I don't recall having heard of it. I, the danger is with the uh, FERPA, they don't want people coming into the classroom right. who aren't part of the classroom. Um, so maybe the maybe I can in. I can refresh my memory on that. Um, Circumventing that through Canva or through Google Docs is well, you, the well, they make the course like semi-public in that you can access it through the URL, but you just can't see the like the people tab or the grades tab. So I've been able to share at least some course content with people outside. Okay. Of the quiz, but they can't, they can't really participate in the same way the students can. Mm -hmm. So 
they, they can still click on that URL and see most sources. And Blackboard Collaborate within Canvas is another tech tool that you can use um, to facilitate meetings outside of um, the class time. And as an instructor, um, you can have digital office hours, for example. Like, and I'll meet with your group. When are you meeting next? 7 p.m.? That's fine. I'll be home with a glass of wine. But I can <laughs> let you see the glass of wine. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I can do that in the comfort of my home. I don't have to come to campus. I can meet at a student-centered time uh, without too much interruption to my life. So that work-life balance remains a little bit more intact. So yeah, tech is making a lot of these things a lot easier. Still not, still hard. And we still run into the people that are why we do stuff. Um, we've had a couple of faculty who, who have shared that in making groups, they found that the students who love group projects, if you put them together, they work well as a group. The students who hate group projects, if you put them together, they like working together and they do better than if they're mixed in with people who like to do group projects, right? <laughs> so that sort of voluntary segregation of we all hate this, but we're right with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, this camaraderie and all hating the same thing, and we'll do a good job. Andrew, you're I was just going to say, in sort of response to this, I've been thinking a lot too about whether these projects look authentic for the content and sort of the students' objectives. Yeah. And so, like, with the community partners, like, what does collaboration for them look like? And to the extent that you can like Canvas may not be a good tool for replicating right. what that looks like. Right. Like if people are still doing stuff over email, like maybe maybe we think that should change, but for the students, like that's the same model. Yeah, we try to meet our community partners where they're at, because we're just people, right? <laughs> Play with us at the same time. So. And I agree. It's a lot of work for them, too, yeah. right? To right. have the students come in, try to save the day, and then leave <laughs> you know, after they've made a mess out of things. <laughs> So that's a, a thing to be very aware of. And, and if you're doing any community stuff, work through the mortgage center because they've got a lot of experience and, yeah. and advice on how to do that. Yeah, their, their community engage scholars program is a really nice community practice that folks who do this all the time are like, yeah, one community partner just dropped out in the food semester. What do I do? <laughs> right. Oh, is that I'm similar to the tech student group here? Yeah, they have. Monthly, at I least think, meetings I think they have bagels too, that are. So. They do. It's called bagels and research, I think, or bagels and. Yeah. The, 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 the name. The pin to start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're not trying anymore. The bagels got me. Yeah. <laughs> we have outreach people, but it would be great to connect them. Yeah. Yeah. We are out of town. So on your way out, if you could check a few boxes, write down a few thoughts, if you have thoughts and time to share, and just drop it off on the table on the way out. Grab some bagels on the way out, refill your coffee, etc., etc. We have enough bagels that if you want to take some home to your, or, well, don't take some home, go back to your office, please do. It's very cold out. Awesome. <laughs> That must be from another <laughs> session. Oh. Let's determine which session. Oh, these are two. Any questions? It makes it easier. It makes it makes it easier. Here's one. Oh, that one. Your pre-filled out evaluation form. Here's the third one. Here's the third one. No, 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 no. Uh, that's mine. This one is yours. yours? That's mine. Not already filled so out. Not already. It was not filled out. Now it is filled out. All right. We're going to use
next Thursday, we're talking about peer review in Canvas. And on Friday, we're talking about how do students go out and find examples of the course content in their lives on the internet.